we are picking up uh, where we left off, Act 4, C4, around line 25. <clears throat> no, take it back. Yes, around line 25. Um, we've just seen Hamlet speaking with the captain. Well, he's going to keep speaking for a, a minute. And the captain, who is Fortinbras captain, bear in mind this is Fortinbras Jr. of Norway. His father was dead, his father was killed by Hamlet Sr. Um, the captain's told Hamlet that they're leading this expedition to fight over, to have a battle over a small, insignificant piece of land. And Hamlet said, 23, why then the Polack will never defend it. Captain, it's already garrisoned. Okay. And the reason Hamlet says he won't defend it is because the captain said it's not even worth five ducats. And he's obviously he's exaggerated there. But he's saying it's such a trifling piece of land, it's not worth anything. Hamlet, two thousand souls and twenty thousand ducats will not debate the question of this straw. This is the imposture of much wealth and peace that inward breaks and shows no cause without why the man dies. So, the question of this straw, your gloss tells you for straw, you know, settling this trifling matter. In some of Shakespeare's other plays, he uses the term straw to replace, in certain characters' mouths, to replace the word honor. That is, they describe honor as nothing but a straw. Uh, you know, a straw is obviously a little piece, a blade of grass, essentially, that is used to feed animals that is utterly worthless. It is totally insignificant. In those plays, honor is being described as being insignificant, insubstantial, really nothing, okay? So, Hamlet's here saying 2,000 ducats, let's say dollars, in 20, uh, 2,000 souls, in $20,000. He said, that's not going to solve this problem. Why? He says, this, this situation is the imposthume, and that's like a swelling sore, a boil, okay, of much wealth and peace that inward breaks. He's saying, essentially, Norway is too much at peace. <coughs> Norway, the country, not the king, is too fat, dumb, and happy. They've got everything going for them. And this is a sickness, okay, that has burst on the inside. Why? Because it's causing, essentially, Fortinbras to look for action. He's, he's got a, a fever, so to speak. He's got to do something. Why? Fortinbras is in the same position as Hamlet. His uncle is king. His uncle should not be king. All right? Fortinbras has got to do something. Notice, it's like, a, it's like this illness that breaks inwardly and shows no cause without why the man dies. That is, there are no external bodily wounds. You, you got to imagine, what would somebody 500 years ago, say 600 years ago, um, you get an appendicitis, appendix erupts, and you die from the septic infection. From the outside, other than a fever, you look fine. You can't see any wound. Okay. Captain leaves. Rosencrantz says, come on, Hamlet, let's get going. Hamlet, hold on a little bit. Go on ahead of me, I'll be there in a second. How all occasions do inform against me. All occasions, all incidents that he's experienced, he says, suggesting, since he spoke with the ghost the first time. When he spoke with the ghost, he said, from this time forth, you know, 
he's going to think only kill Claudius. How all occasions do inform against me and spur my dull revenge. Spur, heat it up, jam it in the, in the hips, as it were, like a horse spur. Why? Because his revenge is dull. We've already heard that. The ghost, back in Gertrude's bedroom, the ghost said, I'm here to wet thy dull revenge, to sharpen it, or dull purpose, he says. Hamlet, what is a man if his chief good and market that is use of his time be but to sleep and feed? Okay, when it, you got the long loss. The best use he makes of his time, or that for which he sells his time, it just means use. If his chief good in use of his time be but to sleep and feed. Look at the way he puts that question. What is a man if all he does is eat and sleep? He's a beast. And when Hamlet uses that phrase, chief good in use, this is literally highest good. Okay? When I had the drawing on the board of, you know, Plato's allegory of the cave, and you had the light, and the light was the summum bonum, the highest good, which according to Aristotle and Plato and Socrates is God, okay? When Hamlet uses those words, he's hearkening back philosophically to this old idea of what is the chief good, the purpose of humanity, all right? Forty years after this play is written, in first produced 42 years, a group of Presbyterians meet in London, the area of London called Westminster, and they come up with what's called the Westminster Confession of Faith. And the Westminster Confession of Faith is a catechism, how to be a good Presbyterian. The first question is, what is the chief um, end and purpose or chief good and purpose of man? Why are we here? They answer it, to enjoy God and glorify him forever, okay? Hamlet is saying, what is the chief good purpose in use of our time? Not of man, but of our time. Because it began with, what is a man? And he says, if our only good in end, use of time, is to eat and sleep, we're nothing more than a beast. A beast no more, sure. A beast no more. He that made us with such large discourse, looking before and after, gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fuss at us and use. So, he that made us, God, with such large discourse. And after discourse, you get that, that a positive phrase. Looking before and after. Is that, well, I kind of said it was. Is that phrase, looking before and after, is that defining large discourse? Or could that refer to he looking before and after? Okay. Or could it apply to us who look before and after? So read it in a variety of ways. He that made us with such large discourse. So what's large discourse? We say today, discourse is, is what I'm doing. It's verbal talk, right? But it doesn't have to be limited to that. It has to do with understanding, perception of the world. Making us with such large discourse that is taking in and trying to understand everything. Looking before and after gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fuss in us unused. So the looking before and after that could refer to godlike discourse, that is our ability, because we don't only think about the present. 
We think about the past, the looking before, and we think about what's to come, the looking after. It could refer to us, that is humans, all of whom, each of whom, at some point asks, why am I here? That's very particular, right? They ask the more general, why are we here? I, I am 100% convinced, could be entirely wrong. The reason cosmologists, astrophysicists are looking for life somewhere else is so that we're not alone. Carl Sagan, real big extraterrestrial life, uh, sought it out while he was alive. Carl Sagan makes that very clear. We want to know that we are not alone, that there is something beyond just us. Why? Because seemingly, for those who are left with the attitude, it's just us, it diminishes the meaning of life, okay? But it could be God, because God sees before and after and now. It's just present. Notice, he gave us discourse. He gave us reason for what purpose? Not to fust in us unused. And you got a gloss there, fust. To grow moldy. How would reason grow moldy? How does anything grow moldy? It doesn't move. It becomes static. Okay? No, we're supposed to look before and look after. We're supposed to take all these possibilities into consideration. So, he goes on. Now, whether it be bestial oblivion, that is, I die like a dog, or cat, or bird, or something on the side of the road, and nothing goes on after that, that is, have no soul, or some craven scruple of thinking too precisely on the event. We don't know what event. Could be the event of death. Some craven scruple of thinking too precisely on the event of death. Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh or that everlasting head not fix his cannon gate self-slaughter. And then to be or not to be, he moves from those ideas to what lies beyond death. Ah, it's that dream, that possibility, he says, that makes conscience make cowards of us all. So he goes on. Of thinking too precisely on the event, a thought which, that is, so if you think too precisely on that event, and you quarter that thought, there's only one part wisdom and three parts coward. The one part wisdom. Hamlet in To Be or Not To Be says, take that back, implies, who wouldn't kill him or herself if they could take care of, by doing so, if it would stop all the problems we have in this life? See. That's the one part wisdom. The three parts cowardice are, yeah, but once you kill yourself, you don't know what's beyond the door of death. And it's that, it's those parts that stop us. I do not know why yet I live to say this thing to do. See, it's the thinking too precisely on the event that he wonders why I am still alive to say this thing is yet to do. I don't think he's talking about thinking about the event of killing Claudius. He's wondering why am I still alive and I haven't yet done this. Since I have cause and will and strength and means to do it. The thing to do is the, to do it, the way he's referring to. He has cause, right? He killed my father, that's cause. I have will, that is, I have the choice to. I have strength, obviously, and the means. He can use any number of means, right? He could poison Claudius, he could hang Claudius, he could beat him to a pulp, he could stab him, a whole bunch of ways. Example, gross says, earth, exhort me. Why gross as earth? Gross there doesn't mean disgusting. It means large, expansive as, 
Anywhere you go, you're what? You're on the earth. Even if you're on the ocean, you're still on the earth. He's saying, everything tells me I should kill Claudius. And he goes, and here's one. Look at this army. Of such mass and charge led by a delicate prince. Large army, good army, he's kind of implying, led by a delicate prince. Delicate there doesn't necessarily mean he's fine and he's kind of a, you know, effeminate, that kind of thing. He just means he's young. Fort Bruss probably in his late teens, maybe early 20s. whose spirit with divine ambition puffed makes mouths at the invisible event. Notice, divine ambition. Doesn't mean he wants to be like God. It means the divine has pushed him. He's being, so to speak, inspired by God to do this. Exposing what is mortal and ensure to all that fortune, death, and danger dare even for an eggshell. So he's willing to risk all for what? Hamlet calls it an eggshell. What is it literally? It's a little piece of land. Why does he say eggshell and not egg? There's a difference. An egg is whole and complete. It still has the yolk and the egg white in it. An eggshell has already been empty. It's already hollowed. It's easier to crush an eggshell than it is an egg. An eggshell, we would say today, is garbage. <laughs> it's refuse. Hamlet is saying, this guy, Fortinbras, is willing to expose everything, to lose everything for an eggshell. Why? What is the eggshell? What is the straw that he's referred to earlier? Rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument. Okay? Rightly to be great, that is to be considered rightly great, means you don't act without marshalling, war. You don't go to war without a good cause. That's what he means. That's the great argument. You know? Why did, never made this connection before, I don't think, why did the founders get together in Philadelphia in 1776? What came out of that? The Declaration of Independence. Why? Because Jefferson and the others, more so Jefferson because he's the one who wrote most of it, said, we can't do this, that is, declare our independence without what? Without an argument. Okay? The argument are all of the wherefore clauses in the Declaration of Independence. All the problems, the wrongs George did to the colonists. So, rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument, but greatly to find quarrel in a straw when honor's at the stake. Okay? When honor is at the stake, Hamlet is suggesting that can be a great argument. So why would a nation go to war over honor? Here's an example. If somebody, a foreign national, assassinated Joe Biden or assassinated the vice president, would that be considered a cause to go to war if we knew the person involved was working literally on behalf of the other country it, you might have to say well it depends on which political party is in charge and that's probably true I hate to say it. most would probably most ordinary people would probably say you know that is a cause at the very least to go to the direct source and remove that okay find out the direct cause, the person who placed the order and such. Honor, Hamlet is suggesting if, if 
your honor is impugned, then that is cause to get into this great argument or great quarrel. So he says, so let me see now. How do I stand then? To have a father killed, great argument, right? I killed my father, prepared to die. Um, a mother stained. Notice that is made passive. Like she received the stain. Everything in the play does not suggest that Gertrude is passive. She is actively involved in this marriage. Okay? Excitements of my reason and blood, and yet all sleep. That is, my father being killed, my mother being polluted, these do what? They excite his reason and his blood. They turn the heat on, so to speak. He's saying, I have good reason. While to my shame, I see, excuse me, and let all sleep. He lets his reason and his blood calm down. He's suggesting I should be fired up. Well, when he listened to the ghost, his first words were, wipe away everything from his mind and replace that with, essentially, kill Claudius. He goes, so compare me with this, the imminent death of 20,000 men. For what? For fantasy and a trick of fame. Your gloss down there for trick tells you a toy or a trifle of fame. What does he mean by that? He's talking about honor. Oh, you defended your honor by going off and sending 20,000 men to their death for a worthless piece of land? Back during the Vietnam War, this would be called a, you know, a hill not worth taking, a hill not worth dying on. They will go to their graves like beds, willingly, for what? For a plot, that is, a piece of land whereon the numbers cannot try the cause. The numbers, the numbers of dead cannot prove or justify the cause for going to war. He's saying, whatever reason, Fortinbras is leading these troops into battle for this little bit of land. The reason is not enough. What do we hear every time there's some big major, you know, military problem worldwide and the United States is considering sending forces over? We hear the argument about, is it our fight or not? Is it justified to send our troops in? If, you know, we hear talk about the war in Ukraine and that if Putin is allowed to succeed there, it will be essentially the beginning of a new World War III because he won't be satisfied with Ukraine. He's going to go into Moldova, and then he's going to the Baltics, etc. If that's the case, and one really believes that, then what would the United States do? We'd stop Putin. We wouldn't be stopping Putin how? Merely by sending materiel. We would get boots on the, if it was really thought that's going to happen, there'd be boots on the ground because of what happened the last time. Yeah, a lot of people would die. How many would die if we let it go to its logical conclusion without stopping them? That's the thing. So he says, they go to their graves like beds. They fight for a plot whereon the numbers cannot try, prove, justify the cause, which is not tomb enough, incontinent to hide this. He's saying, this plot of land won't even hold 20,000 dead bodies. It doesn't take a big piece of land. If you're talking about a battlefield where they die, not necessarily the cemetery, but whether you're talking about a cemetery or a battlefield, it doesn't take more than two or three acres to bury that. Cemetery, because they would be buried in mass graves. From this time forth, my thoughts be bloody 
or be nothing worth. Notice he'd said earlier, excitements of my reason and my blood. So now he finishes from here on, let my thoughts be bloody. That is, let my blood, my desire for revenge, well up into my brain and infuse my thoughts. So he's back to kill Claudius, right? Scene five. Horatio comes in with a gentleman. and the, I, I will not speak with her. And that's probably they come out the door and she says that. The gentleman, she's importunate, that is, she's demanding. She really wants to speak with you. Indeed, distract her mood will need to be pitied. In other words, if you see her, you will take pity on her. Queen, what, would she, what does she want? She's talking about her father, the gentleman says. Okay? She beats her heart. She burns enviously at straw. She speaks things in doubt that carry but half. In other words, she's talking crazy. Somebody needs to speak to her. Okay? Horatio says, for good she were spoken to, line 14, for good she were spoken with, for she may strew dangerous conjecture, conjectures and ill-breeding mind. That is, if you don't let Gert, uh, Ophelia come in and talk with you, and she's out in public, her behavior and her words might cause others to do what? To come up with the wrong ideas. And I don't mean wrong ideas, true ideas that they don't want known, but conspiracy type ideas. Because what's one of the things they're talking about? It's gonna come out in just a minute. Man, you guys buried Polonius very quickly. What's the implication? Why? Why did the government act so fast to do this? Is it hiding something? <coughs> Let her in. And Gertrude says, to my sick soul, as sin's true nature is, each toy seems prologue to some great amiss. So notice she just defined sin's true nature. A sick soul. Sin's true, sin's true nature is an illness of the soul. It's a disease. And she says, each toy seems prologue to some great amiss. Meaning, just as sickness in the soul is the true nature of sin, she's saying, each seemingly random event, what? The true nature of that is they're all pointing towards something. Something bad's going to happen. Back before 9-11, there were, so to speak, within the intelligence community, broadly defined, a bunch of dots, like on a wall, just a bunch of random dots. It was only after 9-11, you know, and people were looking at them like this, dot, 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 dot. And it was only when the intelligence community combined its intelligence briefings and such that the picture became clear. If they shared information before, it would have been stopped. Okay? She's saying there's all these random events. They're not random. They're building to some head. Ophelia comes in. Where's the beauteous majesty of Denmark? Well, who does that refer to? Does it refer to Hamlet? Does it refer to the king? How now, Ophelia? What's up? Um, and Ophelia sings. Uh, what does that mean? Gertrude asks. And she sings some more. He's dead and gone, lady. He is dead and gone. At his head a grass green turf. At his heels a stone. And she goes, uh, Ophelia? She goes, Mark, look. And the king comes in. Look here, my lord. Ophelia sings the king. 
How do you do, pretty lady? God, well, God ill you, ill is shortened form of shield. God protect you. They say the owl was a baker's daughter, and there's a gloss down there, it's a folk tale from England. Lord, we know what we are, but not what we may be. Okay, so that follows this aphorism. They say the owl was a baker's daughter. Reference to a monkish legend that a baker's daughter was turned into an owl for refusing bread to the Savior. We know what we are, but not what we may be. And notice, there's not a gloss for that. Do we know what it means? Anybody know where it comes from? It's from the New Testament. Pretty sure it's Paul, and I'm pretty sure it's 2 Corinthians. We know what we are now, but not what we may be. And then he goes on and says, because now we see, but through a glass darkly, but then we shall see as we are seen, and we'll know as we are known. And what he's talking about is the resurrection, transformation, all that kind of stuff. Hmm. God be at your table. King. Conceit upon her father means... This is caused by the death of her father in her mind. It's, let me rephrase that. The death of her father has caused this fantasy in her mind, this conceit, this idea. She's, uh, in other words, entirely focused on it. She can't escape this. All right? So. She goes on and she sings some more. And the king says, pretty Ophelia. She sings some more. The king asks, how long has she been like this? And Ophelia replies. She's not necessarily replying to the king, but she speaks. I hope all will be well. Well, that's a nice sentiment. Everybody hopes all will be well. We must be patient. But I cannot choose but weep to think that it would lay him in the cold ground. So what does the rest of the speech have to do with, I hope that all will be well? We must be patient. Patient meaning what? Is merely waiting for something being patient? No. Being patient is an attitude in the act of waiting. And here, she has this come, she makes this come after, I hope all will be well. Well, what does it really mean, I hope all will be well? Is this a kind of a pie in the sky, I don't have any reason for it? Hope all will be well? Like when, you know, a, a child learns that, you know, his or her parent died, father or mother died. And it's okay. It's going to be okay. No, you don't know that. Nobody knows that. When people told children after 9-11 that they were going to be okay when both their parents were dead, they were lying through their teeth. You want the child to believe that, but it may not be the case. Or something horrific happens to a child, you know, some red thing about some career criminal offender raping who got out of jail early to rape some 11 year old boy. It's like telling that 11 year old boy, it's gonna be okay. No, that boy's probably not gonna be okay for the rest of his life, all right? So what she, I hope all will be well. She's talking about, she trusts what? Everything will work out in the end. Somehow, all will be well. We must be patient. That is, we must endure how? What makes it possible to endure horrible things? Hope. It's hope that those horrible things, what? Will come to an end. If we know the horrible things that are happening in our life are not just going to happen for today or maybe a week, but it's going to be like this every day. And that's when people start to think to be or not to be. We must be patient. 
but I cannot choose but weep. Then she's saying, I don't really even have a choice in this. To think they would lay him in the cold ground. In the moment of clarity that she had is gone. <laughs> Why would they lay him in the cold ground? Because he was dead. I don't know if you've ever been to a uh, funeral. One of the last ones I was at, a very dear friend. Her husband died. He's about 20 years older than she is. She's my age. He died of Parkinson's and Lewy body and something else. And, and she was just a total, total wreck. I mean, just constantly sobbing and shaking. Why? Because even though she knew Rio was dead, there's that part of her that had been with him for 20 plus years, couldn't escape it, okay? That's why she has a trouble lead, seeing him put in the cold, cold ground. Some of my family members, when my dad died, when my mom died in 2015, 2015, yeah, in 2015, we weren't there for the lowering of the casket into the ground. We had, we had gone away before that. When my dad died, we were, we were there, which I've been to a lot of funerals. In the Orthodox tradition, it's very typical to do that, throw you know, a handful of dirt and stuff on the thing. So we, we were there, and some of the members of my family, they, they had difficulty with that. Seeing that go down and cover it over, because that's what? That's final. It's, there's no escaping that. That is what she's wrestling with. My brother shall know of it. Ooh, I'm going to tell the Hirtes. He's going to do something about this. Okay? King tells Horatio, follow her closely, <laughs> meaning don't let her out of your sight. This is the poison of deep grief. Ooh, yeah. It springs all from her father's death. Question, does it? What does she say about Hamlet after Hamlet's interview with her? She says, you know, he's wasted, blown youth and such. And then she says, oh, woe is me to have seen what I have seen, to see what I see. The question's been, well, the point's been made by many that while Polonius's death is the capping point of Ophelia's madness, Hamlet's loss of reason in that scene with her is what kind of leads her on the road. In other words, that kind of tips the scales and she starts losing it. And then when Polonius dies, that's when she totally snaps, okay? So, he says, Gertrude, Gertrude, when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. What did Gertrude say earlier? She says, there, there are these things, have these toys, that seem to be building to making something amiss. Well, he's saying, sorrows come how? You know, notice, they're not spying out the territory. They're battalions of soldiers. Here are the battalions. First, her father slain. Next, your son gone, right? And the implication is, why would that matter? Well, Ophelia loved him. And he, most violent author of his own, just removed, that is, and he had it coming. The people muddied, the people, that's the populace, the citizens of Elsinore and or Denmark, muddied. They don't have clear understanding. They don't have clear reasoning about these things that are happening. Why not? Well, the truth isn't being told. <clears throat> Thick and unwholesome in their thoughts and whispers for good Polonius's death. And we have done but greedily, greenly in hugger mugger to inter him. In hugger mugger means in silence, in secrecy. 
That's the grieving part. We buried him quickly out of the public eye so that the public is now asking what happened to Polonius? Why isn't the palace telling us? What are they hiding? That's the muddy thought. So that's leading them to conspiracies. Poor Ophelia, divided from herself and her fair judgment. This is like the second or third time Shakespeare has used this image of a person being divided from his or her self. Why? Every time he uses it, he's building and he's pointing towards the scene in Act 5. It's going to come very quickly in Act 5, where Hamlet uses insanity as a plea for innocence in the murder of Polonius. because he's divided against himself. So, he says, and lastly, Laertes has come secretly from France. He's got a whole list of problems to deal with now. He feeds on his wonder, keeps himself in clouds, wants not buzzers to infect his ear with pestilent speeches of his father's death. In other words, he is building mentally in emotionally, in his mind and in his heart, he's building on the unknowns about his father's death. And what do we always tend to do if we don't know something? We formulate possibilities and ideas. And he feeds on those rather than listen to words in his ear. He calls them pestilent words. Why? Pestilent speeches of his father's death. He won't listen, he's suggesting, to the real cause of his father's death. Okay? So, there's a noise. The noise, it says within. Bear in mind, they're in the, the stage when they come out of the doors and they come onto the stage. That stage represents a room. They hear a noise back here that is in a hallway that leads to this room. So noise within means beyond the doors, okay? King, where are my Switzers? That is, my Swiss guards. Let them guard the door, a messenger comes in. And the messenger comes in and talks about Laertes and the insurrection he is leading. The rabble call him Lord. Back up. Young Laertes in Ariacus' head overbears your officers. That's kind of implying he's broken down the barriers. He's now in the outer border of the castle. He's coming. The rabble call him Lord. Who's the rabble? That would be us. Okay. The common people. Call him Lord. And as the world were now but to begin, antiquity forgot, custom not known, that ratifiers and props of every word, they cry, choose we, Laertes shall be king. So when he says they've forgotten antiquity, it's as if they know not custom. He's talking about this, primogenitor. Okay? How so? They're saying they want Laertes as king. Well, who should be king? If anybody. If not Claudius, Hamlet should be king. They're throwing out custom. They're throwing out antiquity. And caps, hands, and tongues applaud it to the clouds. That is, the speaker, the messenger is implying, wherever Laertes grow, goes with this rabble of people around him, and they say this, when they come into marketplaces and things like that, all the others, men, throw their hats off and the, all the others, you know, applaud and cheer. Laertes shall be king, Laertes shall be king, okay? The doors break and Laertes comes in with others. And that with others means People who are armed, 
doesn't necessarily have to be their knights in armor. These could be men with hoes, with pitchforks, <laughs> with scythes. Where's the king? Sirs, you go back, you back down. I'll deal with this. They leave. Oh, thou vile king, give me my father. Call me good Laertes, says the queen. Laertes, that drop of blood that's calm proclaims me bastard. If I have a drop of blood in me that is calm, that is, that is not heated and boiling, then I'm a bastard. Then he goes on and explains. Christ cuckled to my father. Why? Because my mother obviously slept with somebody else. Brands the harlot even here between the chaste unbesmirched, unsmirched brow of my true mother. So, king, what's the cause, Laertes? That is, what is your argument? Why are you here? That thy rebellion looks so giant-like. Giant-like. Overwhelming. Um, try not to get into politics. Where can I use an example? Can't think of one off the top of my head. Overwhelming. Like he has overwhelming force. Giant-like. Let him go, Gertrude. Gertrude is apparently holding on to Laertes' clothes. Or standing in one of the two, standing in front of him, between him and the king. He says, don't fear our person. There's such divinity doth hedge a king that treason can peep to what it would, acts little of his will. There's a divinity that hedges a king, meaning... A king has a godlike quality that stops mere mortals from harming the king. This gets known later, or this is known as essentially the divine right of kings. Paul in the book of Romans, chapter 12, all government is instituted by God, he says, okay? And therefore it ought to be obeyed. Well, in the Middle Ages, it's like, well, that means all kings. Therefore, you can't touch me, right? That's what he says. Laertes, you can't touch me. God is protecting me. What has Claudius seemingly forgotten? How he became king? You know, poured the poison in his brother's ear? Where was God then? Why didn't God protect him? That is, by the way, that's also, when you think about it, it brings up a difference between the Catholic tradition and the Protestant tradition. The Protestant, especially the Calvinist tradition, would say, because that was predestined to happen. God chose Claudius to replace Hamlet Sr., etc. Okay? So, let him go. Let him go, Gertrude. Where's my father? Dead. Well, that was short and sweet. Gertrude by him. He didn't do it. King says, let, let him speak. How came he dead? <laughs> I'll not, don't joke with me. And he essentially says what? The, the speech beginning to hell, allegiance, etc. And fending with, let come what comes. If heaven tries to stop me, I'll stop heaven. If hell tries to stop me, I'll stop hell. In other words, to conscience and grace to the profoundest pit, I dare damnation. God's not going to stop me. Satan's not going to stop me. He, he wants revenge. Okay? Only I'll be revenged most thoroughly for my father. Uh, who's stopping you? The king kind of like, there's the door. <laughs> Go get him, boy. My will. Laertes is saying, is what is stopping me right now, not all the worlds. So, King says, is it writ in your revenge, that is, is it demanded of in your revenge that you will draw both friend and foe, winner and loser? Draw means kill. Is, is part of your revenge just to willy-nilly kill Scattershot? 
none but his enemies. No, I'm not going to kill my father's friends. Okay, would you like to know who they are? That is, your father's enemies. Laertes, to his friends, I'll open my arms wide. Okay. Now you speak like a good child and a true gentleman. And that's the kind of way, he's kind of saying, that's what Polonius would like you to say. In other words, you shouldn't kill indiscriminately to get revenge. Only the person who did the wrong should be killed. Okay? Ophelia comes in, madder than a lark. Okay? She leaves, skipping a bunch, and the king says to Laertes, line 195, Laertes, I must commune you with your grief, for you deny me right. That is, or you deny me what I have, what is appropriate. I want to share your grief with you. How does he want to share his grief with him? He's going to help him get his revenge. So he says, line 203, be you content to lead your patience to us. Lend your patience to us. We shall jointly labor with your soul to give it due content. All right? Or content. We either give you good meaning to your soul as a result of your patience, or I will bring satisfaction to your soul. Both words, both meanings work. Larity says, let this be, okay? King says, don't worry, we'll work together on this. Scene six, Horatio and a gentleman come in. The gentleman gives Horatio a letter from Hamlet. Hamlet explains how he's gotten his freedom. Two days aboard ship, ship was attacked by pirates, there was a scuffle, Hamlet was taken captive, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are still on their way to England, and they now bear letters for the king regarding them, okay? Scene seven, king comes in with Laertes, and he says, now must your conscience my acquittance seal and you must put me in your heart for friend. What does it mean to be acquitted of a crime? It's to be found not guilty. He's saying, your conscience must find me not guilty. Why? Because they've been talking, apparently, about how Polonius died. Okay? So Laertes says, why didn't you stop Hamlet before? Lines 5, 6, and following. Why you proceeded not against these feats so criminal and so capital in nature? Two reasons. And they're good reasons, you have to admit. King says, to me, they're good reasons. You may not think so. What's the first one? Gertrude hangs on every word Hamlet says. Gertrude loves inordinately her son. And the king implies, if something happened to Hamlet, she'd lose it. Okay. What's the other reason? Line 16, the other motive why to a public count I might not go is the great love the general gender bear him. That is, Hamlet is beloved by the people. You gloss for general gender, just the common people. If I were to act against Hamlet, look how easy it was for Laertes to raise a rabble. What is this telling us? The people aren't happy with Claudius, by the way. I mean, to me, that's an implication of what's going on there. Laertes. So I have a noble father lost and a sister driven into desperate terms. He says, oh, my revenge will come. King, don't, don't lose any sleep over that. He says, don't think that I am made of stuff flat and dull, that we can let our beard be shook with danger and think it past time. You'll hear more soon. Meaning, we will plot together against Hamlet. Okay? Uh, it's 10.05. We will stop there 
and pick up with the king reading the letter from Hamlet, round line 42, for Monday. Um, don't forget, there is quiz over Act 3, which is due Sunday night. Um, let me just throw this out, since I had people in all three classes do this on a previous quiz. Don't cheat. Don't use Google. Um, there's a question on the quiz over Acts 1 and 2 that are probably a total of, I don't know, a dozen people across three classes immediately got on Google. And I know that because I, I've seen it before. Same question, same answer. It's only found on Google. Not been used in the class and is not used in the book. So don't use Google. <laughs>